I've been asked to reflect a little bit on some of the possibly unstated origins of saturation church planting, because saturation church planting is really what we're talking about in terms of church planting movements. Some of you may know this and some of you may not, so we'll find out. So, saturation church planting in one way or another, by the way, uh, if any of you want these PowerPoints afterwards, I can let you have them, so that's fine. Saturation church planting in one way or another um, owes some of its thinking to work that was done by a group called Dawn, discipling a whole nation. I don't know how many of you uh, have come across Dawn as a concept. Some of you I know have used the Dawn name in some of your national uh, organizations, but actually it was a system that came originally from the work of Jim Montgomery in the Philippines, and it was credited with taking a relatively small number of churches in a small number of denominations to a national movement and caused a huge increase in the percentage of people who were born again believers. So it was sufficiently successful that those who were behind that movement started to export it to other countries. Now, the problem with that was that um, to a certain extent, some of the export was done without much reflection on contextualization. And that was particularly a problem for Europe because uh, Europe already had a long history of engagement with Christianity in a way that some of the countries that Dawn was taken to did not have. And that contextualization made a difference. So there was very little um, reflection on the methodology or the as assumptions. So what was the original Dawn strategy? Well, essentially it had five elements. And the first element, uh, nobody's going to complain about, that is to uh, detect where there are natural prayer movements and to seek to integrate those prayer movements in a nationwide attempt to pray particularly for church planting. Second of all, um, research to try and discover uh, what is actually happening, which uh, denominations are growing, which are not growing, which are planting, which are not planting, and also through that research to be able to detect where church planting might be needed, both in terms of geography, but also in terms of people groups, socioeconomic groups. So research was the second component. The third component was to try and encourage the denominations to come together around some kind of national organization, some kind of national committee that would try and coordinate these various efforts around church planting with the view that this would make the task more effective. So denominations and also mission agencies that had an interest in church planting, bringing them together around a national process. The fourth element was to establish goals around church planting. Now this in some ways was the biggest problem with Dawn uh, because there was a statement that was accepted uncritically by many people that there ought to be one evangelical church for every thousand people. Why? You might ask. For, for a thousand people. Well, of course, in the Philippines it made perfect sense. Because in the Philippines, an administrative unit, if you like, a community of people, was approximately a thousand people, and it was called a barrio. 
And so actually in the Philippines, it wasn't so much a church for every thousand people, it was a church for every community, it was a church for every barrio. Now when you translate it that way, it makes perfect sense. But if you just try and take a population and try and imagine a church for every thousand people, actually it becomes a bit crazy. And unfortunately that's what happened, particularly in a European context, we've got to have a church for every thousand people without any reference to how societies, communities were organized. And that's where the thing started to fall apart. The, the fifth element was to hold a national congress and the idea of the national congress, possibly every three years, was to try and track and encourage progress against the stated goal. So, if we were to critique Dawn, what would we be saying? Well, the first thing uh, is to say that actually Dawn as a methodology works best in a situation where there is already a good degree of spiritual receptivity. Now, I put it that way because actually I'm not saying receptivity to the gospel, I'm saying spiritual receptivity. In other words, in cultures and communities, in societies where there is already an understanding that God is somehow an important agenda item. <laughs> it's a curious thought for Europeans, but most societies in the world think that God matters. <laughs> um, most societies in the world can't imagine a situation where you would think of living your life without God. Whereas, of course, we know that in Europe, it's almost the other way around, isn't it? Most of our societies think, but why would you need to imagine God? We seem to live our life perfectly well without God. Is this some kind of self-help therapy? Or, you know, wh why are you introducing God to our situation? Well, actually, um, that is a problem then when you start to include assumptions about church planting that actually belong to societies for whom talk about God is quite natural. Second of all, as I've already explained, the figure of 1,000 uh, just does not take account of what already exists on the ground. It doesn't take account of the fact that, especially in Europe, there are already quite a number of churches, and many of those churches, uh, especially in Northern Europe, um, take a view of their societies that involves a concept of parish or territory. And therefore, it's not just quite so easy to transfer this concept to a situation that has a long historical engagement with Christianity. The other thing about Dawn is that it doesn't take account of the fact that um, our nations have quite a different history and experience of the evangelical presence. And that makes a difference. <laughs> when you're thinking about resource, when you're thinking about strategies, um, for example, uh, in a nation like England, my nation, um, you can begin to think in terms of denominational church planting strategies in the sense that most denominations have some resource. But if you think about Italy, or if you think about uh, many of the nations that have uh, quite a small evangelical presence, actually it's quite difficult to transfer the same concepts to those kinds of settings. So actually you have to take account of the diversity of presence in terms of evangelical resource and uh, activity on the ground. So that's just a little um, introduction, if you like, to uh, Dawn as a concept because 
when we're talking about church planting, um, what we have to do is take account of the fact that there are these difficulties. So the question then naturally comes, in terms of what we're doing here these three days, what is it that's different? Well, there are some differences, and I want to point you to three differences. The first is that we are thinking about contextualization. In other words, nobody is imagining that the same process is going to work in Italy as it does in France, as it does in England, as it does in Norway. Each of these national processes are going to look different. In other words, this is not one size fits all. There's going to have to be some quite different design concepts. Second of all, we're placing the emphasis on learning, not on the model. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, originally, the Dawn concept was sold on the basis that the model itself, if you just follow the model, it will all work. <laughs> and I think what we've discovered is that's not true. We need to take the model, <laughs> and then we need to do some learning. And that's why we have called this uh, about, well, this is why we've called this church planting learning communities. Because actually, there's a whole raft of learning that we need to engage in if we're going to be able to take these principles and apply them effectively. The third thing um, is that we have to think about the recruitment of church plants. It's no good thinking about planting thousands of churches if the leadership that we've been producing, in fact, are orientated towards pastoring and teaching. And for most European situations, that is exactly how our leadership has been trained. Uh, that's how our theological seminaries are constructed. That's how our Bible colleges uh, have been orientated. We've been trying to produce pastors and teachers for our existing congregations. Church planters are quite different sorts of people. And they need quite different sorts of training. But more important, they need quite different sorts of selection. I can absolutely guarantee that the selection processes of most denominations will exclude those who are gifted as church planters. They're almost designed to do that, actually. Now, that's a problem. And we've got to think about how we then recruit church planters, given that our existing systems try and filter people with those kinds of giftings out of the system because to a certain extent they are troublemakers. <laughs> and they have to be troublemakers in order to accomplish church planting. So these are entrepreneurial types. You can use the language of apostolic, of prophetic, of evangelistic, but let's just use the, the language of entrepreneurial types. They are people who think imaginatively and differently about situations. Now, I want to make this slightly outrageous claim for a minute, and uh, maybe we can discuss it later, but uh, here's my outrageous claim. I suspect that most of the church planters we're going to need for Europe have not yet been converted. I suspect that they've not yet been converted. Now, there's a challenge. How would we begin to construct evangelistic processes that would deliberately target leaders in communities and then mentor them in such a way that we can fast track them and get them into church planting reasonably quickly. How would we go, go about that? Because here's the, the, the truth. Most of the evangelism that I see, some of which is, is fantastically successful, produces great church members, but not great church planters. Somehow or another, we're going to have to come up with different evangelistic strategies to begin to target those who are natural leaders, because I don't know if you've noticed, but natural leaders in society are not coming into our churches at the moment. 
it's going to take a completely different style of thinking. Now, I've not discussed this with Oivind, I've not discussed it with uh, many people actually, but I'm absolutely convinced that somewhere along the line, there's going to have to be a sea change in our ability to convert completely different kinds of people in order to produce the leadership that church planting is going to require. That's a little bit controversial, <laughs> but I wanted to leave you with that thought as we move into this next phase. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes. If there is anybody that wants to ask a question of clarification, I've deliberately allowed two or three minutes for that purpose, or you can feel free to completely disagree with me. That's all right. Yeah, now that, that's helpful. Actually, um, yeah, the question was uh, in the original Dawn uh, strategy that was rolled out, there was uh, a, a requirement around mentoring, but there were no strategies for mentoring. Now, actually, I just want to ask a question of clarification here, because do you mean mentoring or do you mean coaching? The word that was used was mentoring. Yeah. Okay, the word that was used was mentoring. Um, Lee says, and that, that's absolutely right. But here's the slight difference. Um, when Americans use the word coaching, Europeans mean mentoring and, and vice versa. So we just need to be clear about what, what we're actually meaning. But both would be true. Whether it's coaching or whether it's mentoring, there have not been systems. And I don't think for the most part there still probably aren't too many systems around. I think there are some beginning to emerge now, but mostly those systems don't exist. And, and they are actually quite important when it comes to this kind of activity. And that's different from uh, the kind of theological education that normally would be available to those who are going into seminaries. Coaching and mentoring is not part of the language structure uh, of those institutions for the most part. In fact, I can remember in around about 1993 it was, going to the principal of a theological college in the UK and asking the question, could you include church planting on your agenda for the seminary? And uh, nice guy, and he looked at me as if I were completely mad and said, but why would we want to do that? We're a theological college. Now, I understood exactly what he meant. There wasn't a framework, if your starting point is Schleiermacher, to, in, to allow for that kind of activity. So we still face that same problem. Where are we going to get mentors from? Where are we going to get coaches from? In order for those who go into church planting uh, to be properly supported. And here's the reality. I think we've got enough evidence now to suggest that Church planters who have coaches and mentors are much, much more likely to be successful than those who do not have them. So it's something to, to think about. Anyone else? Yes. That's a very good question. Um, usually in church history, uh, revivals, and where do I see the... Um, yeah, where do I see, the question was, where do I see uh, these kinds of church planters being converted was the question. It's a very good question. In church history, normally, uh, people have come from the margins. So actually, we might be surprised to discover that uh, some of these leaders are going to come from working class communities. Some of the best leaders might be, for example, currently running Drug rackets, drug dealers are great leaders. They've got fantastic networks. Imagine what could happen if they could turn those networks to the kingdom 
uh, instead of the other way around. We might be surprised where some of these uh, leaders come from. Um, wasn't it the case that in the Salvation Army, when they first got going, it was some of the biggest rogues that got converted? <laughs> Still is, <laughs> according to some of the Salvation Army people here. <laughs> yes. So I think we might be surprised. I, I think the main thing is that we've got to lose our present understanding of, of what a leader looks like because some of the leaders we need might actually be quite surprising. Hopefully you all heard that, but just in case you didn't, uh, how could we change our training in relation to all that? Okay, most training that has happened over the last, let's say, 100 years, has, tried to has taken people out of their context and into a seminary. And by the time people have finished that educational process, they're actually not suited to going back into the context from which they originally came. So, Training needs to keep people in their context. In other words, um, it's going to be the kind of training that is on the job, where the trainers are those who've actually done the job successfully. In other words, they're practitioners themselves. It used to be said, if you can't do it, go and teach it. We've got to stop that. We've actually got to have people who can do it in the classroom. Um, we need to focus as much on character and skills as we do on theory. The training has got to be much more flexible so that people could come and do some training and then stop for a while and then return to it. It's just got to be incredibly flexible, very local, keeping people in their context that's the kind of training we need. I'm not sure I caught, quite caught that, Yuri. What kind of learning was in the UK because the dawn process collapsed, it blew up under the weight of its own expectation? Um, I think the main thing is that the emphasis originally was on how many churches you plant rather than on what we're planting. And what happened was that out of that <coughs> difficulty, and it was a difficulty, we took some time out to ask the question, what are we planting? What is church, really? And rather than just reproducing the failed models of the past, what might church actually look like? And to a certain extent, the Fresh Expressions movement has come out of that process of reflection. What is church? And how would we imagine it completely differently in a new planting context? Raphael. The dawn is dead, long live dawn. <laughs> Why do we need to stay to, uh, if we talk about national uh, refreshing processes, why not just leave that to emerging refreshing uh, happening on the ground? And why do we still need to talk about a nationwide thing? What is the added value? <coughs> Uh, what's the added value of um, using a process, a national process, rather than just allowing things to uh, emerge? Well, I can say that in England, there's a fantastic amount of church planting just happening anyway. So you could, at least in England, take that argument. But I think most of us can see that actually where we connect leaders in a national process, we accelerate what's already happening, especially in terms of uh, profiling examples of good practice, challenging people's imagination, helping people to think differently, investing in different training programs, all of those kinds of things begin to happen 
when people have uh, some kind of participation in a national process. Trevor. Yeah. How, how do we engage with, um, yeah. 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 How do we engage in the changing demographics of Europe, particularly when this is a fairly monocultural kind of grouping in one way, in one way? That's a very good question. Uh, some spectacular things are beginning to happen uh, in Europe um, in some of these cross-cultural situations. Uh, one of my students um, is leading a ministry and he told me recently uh, that through his ministry a hundred Afghan and Iranian men have just converted uh, in a single city, in the city of Leicester. And uh, it's just, it's quite stunning. The city put on a festival recently, and uh, it was a multicultural festival, and these guys jumped up on the stage, a hundred of them, and said, we want to tell you our story of multicultural Britain. We have become Christians. It was a stunning moment. The crowd was stunned. And conversation about this is going right through the community in Leicester. So I think we could be on the verge of some astonishing, stunning things. How do we do that? Well, we've just got to get better at, for example, how do we engage, how do we teach people in reverse mission? Because here's one of the realities. We've got vast numbers of Christians from Africa, Asia, and South America now living in Europe, and they are spectacularly unsuccessful at reaching the, res the host population. And that's going to become a massive problem because there's a danger they will not keep their children and their grandchildren. So how we deal with that now is actually critical. And, and probably only church planting has got the kind of flexibility to be able to take that, that problem seriously from a strategic and a missiological point of view. My golly, I like your questions, but we're probably out of time. Thank you very much.